Hello, my name is Grégoire Bordy. I am one of the founders and the CEO of ID Quantique, and it's really a big pleasure for me to join you on this uh, annual meeting. My friend Kitesak asked me to tell you about quantum cryptography and its application today, which is one of the main activities of ID Quantique, and it's really a pleasure for me to share our experience with you. So we will now start with this presentation on quantum safe security in 2020. First, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about ID Quantique. It's a Swiss company founded in 2001 uh, in Geneva, in Switzerland, by four quantum physicists. I was one of them. I had done my PhD at the University of Geneva, and then with some colleagues, we had the impression that there was a big opportunity for quantum cryptography uh, and other quantum technologies and decided to start the company. Uh, ID Quantique now has three locations, so we still have our headquarters in Geneva, but we also have a lab and team in Korea, in South Korea, in Seoul, and as well as a smaller team uh, in the US, in Boston. The company has about 100 employees and half of them are engineers and scientists. Uh, recently, or two years ago in 2018, we received investment from large telecom companies, SK Telecom, which is the leading telecom company in South Korea, as well as Deutsche Telekom, which um, uh, is a leading European uh, telecom operator. We have two activities, and today I'll focus mostly on, on one of them, the security-related application of quantum technologies. But we also do quantum sensing, so application of quantum technologies to measure some uh, physical properties. So ID Quantic is a rather you know, old company, 19 years uh, in this very new field. Uh, but I would still like to call it a startup. And the reason is that we've done many world first, world premiere in terms of deploying quantum technologies. So when the company was started in 2001, we started with uh, selling the first quantum random number generator. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, the first products uh, that we brought to the market. A few years later, you know, it took us time, uh, but a few years later in 2007, we did the first world demonstration of quantum key distribution in Geneva. And we've improved products, uh, released our third generation of QPD products in 2016, moved QRNG to a chip, uh, and recent milestones in terms of application was that in 2019, SK Telecom applied our QKD technology to its 5G network. And we also uh, were the first this year, and I'll tell you more about it, uh, the, the, the first to, to integrate with Samsung a QRNG chip in a smartphone, in a 5G smartphone. So this has been uh, uh, really a very interesting uh, journey uh, of, over the past 19 years. And as I mentioned, the company was started by physicists. And so I have to tell you a little bit about uh, the context of physics so that you understand uh, why uh, what we do is so special. So, uh, you know, you, you probably have some uh, physics background, but you know that there's classical physics which uh, was the physics, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, was developed until 1900. You know, it's the classical mechanics of Newton, for example, the falling apple of Newton. And around 1900, a new theory, a new physical theory, was um, was uh, developed by people like Planck, Einstein, Bohr, Schrödinger, Heisenberg. You know the the founding fathers of, of quantum physics. And, and this new theory was called quantum, is quantum physics. And it described very small systems, microscopic systems, elementary particles, atoms, um, you know, the world of very small things. Classical physics, we're, you know, we have quite a bit of intuition with it. We know it quite well. We've been, you know, we, when we grow up, we're exposed to classical physics. We see apples falling from, from trees. Uh, and, and so we know about it. Quantum physics is a bit less intuitive, and there are some very fundamental differences between classical physics and quantum physics. One of them is that uh, classical physics is deterministic. 
if you know where a system is, then you can really uh, predict its evolution. So, you know, it's like, like a clock in a sense. You can predict how it will evolve. In quantum physics, it's a bit different. There are some phenomena in quantum physics that are fundamentally random. You cannot predict which outcome, what will happen, but you can calculate the probability of the different outcomes. Uh, and so, so that's very fundamentally different. And uh, people that discovered or invented quantum physics didn't like it, uh, particularly Einstein, didn't like it. And you know, he had this very famous sentence saying that he couldn't believe that uh, God plays dice with the universe. But actually, it seems that probabilistic behavior is fundamental in, in quantum physics. And we will use that. To, we'll see that we can use that to build good random number generators, which are very important tools in in, in uh, various fields. The second thing is that in quantum physics, if you observe a quantum system, you modify it. This is often explained as the, uh, the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You cannot measure something passively without modifying it. Of course, in classical physics, this is not, like, uh, not the case. If you observe or not the apple, it will fall in the same way. Uh, in, in, with a with a quantum apple, with, a, with an atom or something, if you observe it, you actually perturb it. And this is what is used in quantum key distribution. But anyway, quantum physics is really different and it enables new technologies. And we are about to see what people, some people call the second quantum revolution. There already was a quantum revolution, which led to technologies such as lasers, semiconductor, and uh, these technologies are applications of quantum physics, but these applications use a large number of quantum uh, particles. You know, a laser emits a lot of photons, not one photon at a time. Now we are starting a second quantum revolution where quantum systems are taken one by one, uh, doing communication one photon at a time, doing uh, uh, processing information one quantum object at a time. And this uh, field of quantum technologies has typically three subfields, quantum sensing, how to use quantum physics to measure physical properties well, quantum computing, how to build a computer that works according to the laws of quantum physics, and quantum communications, how to send information using quantum properties. Quantum computing is an interesting technology. It has a good side and a bad side. It can be used to simulate systems to optimize uh, calculations. Uh, so it has application in various fields, energy, industrial goods, pharma, drug discovery, uh, finance. But it also has one application, which is to break currently used cryptographic schemes. And so this bad side creates some challenges. And we will see what these challenges are and how they can be addressed. With the potential of quantum technologies, it's really generated a large amount of investment. On this slide, I've listed some of the largest investment by countries and regions in the field of, of quantum technologies. And you can see, you know, numbers are billions of dollars or billions of, of, of euros. The U.S. has announced a U.S. national quantum initiative, one point two seven five billion dollars. Canada has a billion dollar initiative. Uh, Germany, 2 billion, 2.65 billion euros. So really large investments, which is, which is uh, good because it's going to enable these technologies to move ahead very fast, but there are really high expectations. I've tried to see, uh, to find information by Thailand. I was not able to find uh, public information in English about investment by Thailand, but I suspect that there are also some significant investment in, in Thailand. So we discussed earlier that quantum computers create challenges for uh, security, information security. Essentially, the, there are some cryptographic schemes that are based on the difficulty of solving this problem. You see that if you have a large integer here, you know, this large in integer that I show on, uh, on this um, slide, uh, it is difficult to find the two prime factors. You have two numbers, uh, 
prime numbers, uh, which when you multiply them, give this large number. This is a difficult calculation to do, uh, and there are no efficient algorithm uh, known uh, based on, on classical computers. So you essentially have to try one by one. Can I divide this by two? No, it doesn't work. Can I divide by three? No, it doesn't work. And you go like that until you find uh, one of the factors, which uh, takes a lot of time, and uh, and and uh, you can make the number longer, and then it takes even more time. So you see that there's kind of a linear approach with classical computers. With quantum computers, I mentioned earlier that there is uh, a property in quantum physics which is called superposition. And superposition is kind of counterintuitive, but uh, essentially uh, some in the world of quantum, you can be in different, a uh, system can be different states at the same time. I could be uh, in Geneva, if I was quantum, I could be in Geneva and in Bangkok at the same time as a quantum object. Uh, obviously, I'm only in Geneva because I'm, uh, I live in the classical world. And this superposition enables to build a superposition of all the possible inputs. If you want to do a calculation with different possible inputs, you try them, instead of trying them one by one, you create a superposition of all these inputs and then you run the computer uh, once. This is not exactly true, but this is to give you a little bit of a feeling why quantum computers um, can be faster for certain problems. And one of these problems is actually breaking the, 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 the keys by finding the, the prime factors. Uh, and so you see that using the, such a quantum computer, we would be able to find these two large numbers uh, very fast. And if, uh, you know, in principle, it could be done in a matter of minutes. So, so that's very important because it means that the crypto systems that you are based on this problem or on, on similar problems which, which are equivalent uh, would lose all uh, security if uh, uh, when there will be a quantum computer. So which one are these? Well, you, you've probably heard of them. You know, there's RSA, there is Diffie-Hellman, there is elliptic curve. So these are the most widely deployed and used uh, asymmetric crypto systems and they're vulnerable to quantum computing. Now, what does it mean? Do we have to worry? Well, first we have to see if there is a quantum computer. And it's interesting, there are quantum computers. There's significant investments by all the large companies. You see here, uh, I've listed the companies with the largest, uh, with the most significant efforts in quantum computing. There's Google, there's IBM, there's Microsoft, Honeywell, Intel. So these are large IT companies and they have significant investment in the field of uh, quantum computing. There are also small startups, uh, Rigetti, IMQ, Fanadu, smaller startups that are also working uh, um, in the field of building a quantum computer, trying new approaches, trying to be more agile than large companies. Uh, and they've been able to secure significant venture capital investments in order to uh, build teams and try their approaches. So there are quantum computers. The only thing is that they're still too small. They don't have enough qubits and they're qubits. So, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention what a qubit is. A qubit is a quantum bit. So it would be a quantum systems that can code a two level bit of information, zero one. And so quantum computers are based, uh, are built out of qubits. Uh, and these qubits, you, you need enough of these in order to break, break keys, and you need these qubits also to be stable enough. And so these quantum computers that exist, they're still not stable enough, and the number of qubits is still uh, too small. But nevertheless, the race is on, and it's very likely that uh, in the near future there will be some significant progresses. And when these progresses come, what is at risk for cryptography? So you may know that uh, typically cryptography is is, is um, separated into two groups. There's symmetric crypto or secret key cryptography, where the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt information. Uh, and and this uh, cryptography would be okay. It would be it would resist uh, quantum uh, computing. There are no known attacks based on a quantum computer. There's also a, 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 there's another class which would be at risk. I've already mentioned RSA, uh, DPM, and elliptic curve. These this is asymmetric cryptography based on uh, integer factorization or equivalent problems. And so in this case, 
you, you probably know that there's a public key that is used to encrypt and a private key that is used to decrypt. This is typically used to exchange keys or to do signatures. And this would be at risk if uh, there would be, uh, when there will be a quantum computer. There's also a third class of crypto systems you know, based on hash functions for which there are no known quantum attacks and which would resist. It can be used to do signatures. Uh, but so we, we still have the problem of key exchange uh, in, in, in when there will be a quantum computer. Why? Well, uh, physicists have been able to propose two algorithms based on a quantum computer, and it's an interesting situation. You have to understand that the idea of quantum computer came in the, uh, let's say, uh, I think the first mention was by uh, Richard Feynman in the 80s, but really the field started developing in the 90s, uh, initially from a theoretical point of view, where people said, well, we don't have a quantum computer, but if I could build one, if there was one, what could I, what kind of algorithm could I run? And there's one algorithm which is known as Shor's algorithm, which can be used to uh, uh, factor large integers. And so it has an impact on RSA elliptic curve, uh, Diffie-Hellman. So essentially, it would break TLS and SSL and IT as we as we know it. Good news is that. Uh, the algorithm was invented before there was a quantum computer, so we know about this vulnerability and we can prepare. There's also a second algorithm which is relevant but has a smaller impact. It's known as Grover's algorithm, also from the 90s, and it's uh, it's an algorithm to do a search in an unsorted database, and it can uh, increase, uh, accelerate this search. The impact of such a, an algorithm on sym is on symmetric crypto. And it cuts the key length in half in terms of security. So if you work with AES with 128 bits of security, uh, of, of key, sorry, key length, you, you only have in, in quantum world only 64 bits of security. And this is not enough because then brute force attacks can be used. But if you use uh, AES with a 256 key, a bit key length, then you still have 128 bit security even against a quantum adversary. And this is enough. And so that's why, if I go back on, on the previous slide, that's why we say symmetric crypto is okay. Grover, no impact provided the key is long enough. But asymmetric crypto, there is a problem and we need to see what to do. So what's very important to, to do is to, to ask yourself when you should worry about this problem. And um, because some people say, well, who, who cares? You know, uh, there, there are no quantum computers. We can wait until there is a quantum computer uh, before worrying about this. Uh, when we started ID Quantique in 2001, you know, I was telling, talking to potential customers about the problem, and they were all telling me, oh, you know, not a problem. I will be retired when there will be a quantum computer. So, you know, don't bother me with this problem. Now things are a bit more difficult, and most people probably attending this annual meeting will not be retired when there will be a quantum computer. And in order to think about the, the timeline of the risk, Michele Mosca came up with what's now known as Mosca's theorem. Uh, Michele is a, is a professor at the University of Waterloo. And he says, okay, there are three quantities. First of all, X, which is the security shelf time. Uh, how long should my data be protected? And of course, this depends for various information. Credit card numbers, maybe a few years, uh, uh, patient records, health records, probably decades, longer time, strategic secrets, uh, even longer. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, my data, how long do I need to protect this data? Uh, the second quantity is Z. When will there be a quantum computer? You know, not now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And uh, most specialists say that in a five to ten years' uh, time, we have to, um, to to be uh, to be careful. And so uh, there is the problem, the risk, the uh, intercept now and decrypt later attack. You know, some people explain that uh, an adversary could intercept data exchange today, store it, and you know that storage doesn't cost much, and then wait until there's a quantum computer 
uh, in order to um, to decrypt the data. And so if your data is still valuable, if it has a long X or an X which is uh, longer than uh, Z, then uh, you have a problem. Uh, and so, so, so that's one thing, one way to look at things. The other thing is that you need also to plan for t- some time for migration. Migration, you know, it's going to take time to upgrade the system so that they resist quantum computing. One example, a few years ago, uh, ATMs used by banks moved from one crypto system, DES, to another crypto system, AES. And it took years and even decades to upgrade all of these ATMs to new uh, encryption. So we know that some, some things take a lot of time. And so if X, so if the time needed to encrypt plus the time needed of, of data security is larger than Z, the time when there will be a quantum computer, we're going to have a problem. We, 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 because, uh, it means that we, we haven't, uh, we, we won't be able to provide the security that is required. And I think now we're at a time really where people need to start thinking about X and Y and see if they're close to 10 years, they should really start work. And so what can be done in this case? Well, you know, what we try to explain uh, our, our customers is that there are three, three things to do. First of all, use quantum technologies to generate strong keys. Keys, you know, if the keys are not strong, uh, the security will not be, uh, be good. And so there's a good way to generate strong keys based on quantum technologies. And I'll go through them in more detail. Then think about security and cryptographic schemes on the basis of what people call crypto agility, the ability to change and upgrade cryptography, and then start looking at quantum key distribution in order to secure uh, some very critical information. And we're going to look at these all one by one. Uh, so the first thing is uh, quantum random number generation, which is one of the applications of quantum technologies in cybersecurity, and so first of all, you know, true random numbers, random zeros and ones um, are used to, to create keys. And if you have true random numbers, you have strong keys. And if you have strong keys, you have secure crypto systems. And generating random numbers in a, in a computer is not an easy thing because a computer is deterministic. And as I said earlier, classical physics is deterministic. On the other hand, quantum physics is fundamentally random. And so it makes a lot of sense to use quantum physics in order to, gener- to, to generate true random numbers and to generate strong keys. And so there's one example here of a quantum process. If you have a source of photons, photons are elementary particles of light, quantum, uh, quantum systems of light. You send these photons one by one on a semi-transparent mirror, sometimes also known as a beam splitter. The photons will be reflected or transmitted, but this is a random choice based on quantum physics. And if the photon is detected here, you call that a zero. If it's transmitted, you call that a one. And then you can generate a long uh, sequence of zero and ones. You can use them as keys, but also other applications of um, of um, uh, random numbers. And the advantage of this approach is that it is fast. It can work very fast, uh, so you can produce a lot of random numbers. It is very robust. It cannot be influenced by external uh, 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 interference. And then it's also a very simple process, as you can see. Uh, and so it's easy to model it and to prove theoretically that it is secure. So so that's uh, that's good. And so uh, these products exist. They were actually the first products that we brought to the market. And you can see here some of our products, quantum random number generators. So we have chips. Uh, uh, these products can, can, can take the form of tiny chips. Uh, this is something we introduced recently, just two years ago. But there are also some modules that can be installed in a server and uh, appliances uh, for this. I will not spend too much time on this, but just mention that this year, uh, in uh, June of this year, Samsung launched the first uh, smartphone equipped with a quantum random number generator. Uh, And that's really the first, I would say, the first um, mass market application of this second quantum revolution. Okay, 
Uh, and yeah, I forgot to mention also that um, SK Telecom is using our partner in Korea is using random number generator, gen random number generated by a quantum random number generator since 2019 in their um, authentication center for 5G. So whenever a mobile, 5G mobile connects to an antenna and to a core, or there is an authentication which is done using some uh, crypto keys and random numbers, uh, and these come from a central uh, um, uh, data center using uh, a quantum random number generator. So that's one application which is interesting, and essentially, whenever you need random numbers, you should use a quantum random number generator in order to be sure that you have good good numbers. So I said, you know, you start with strong keys, then make sure that uh, you, you, you have uh, in your uh, crypto system, you have crypto agility. We already discussed, you know, some schemes that we use now are not secure. Some are still secure, can still be used here. Uh, but essentially, uh, there will be evolution. You know, um, when you deploy a system, maybe in a few years from now, you will need to change it in order to uh, implement new crypto systems that are resistant to quantum computing. And so that means that you need to make sure that you can upgrade them. And sometimes, uh, the most, most of the time, actually, cryptography tend to be hard coded in, in, in systems. And so it makes it difficult to upgrade to new cryptography. Uh, and so there's this concept of crypto agility to be able to change, uh, uh cryptography and essentially uh, there are two ways in order to do this. First, uh, it's to try to, to use what some people are trying to find new classical algorithm based on math, but which are resistant to known quantum attacks. This is also known as post-quantum crypto. I would not say too much. Uh, and quantum key distribution, which is using quantum physics in order to secure uh, uh, communications, and which I'm going to explain more in the rest of this uh, presentation. But the key point here is to say cryptography should be seen as a toolbox. You have different tools in the box and you should be able to, 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 to take one tool or another uh, and change, um, change, uh, to change the tools that you're using without having to change completely uh, your system so that you can ensure that you remain secure in the long term. And now we get to, uh, to quantum key distribution. And so, you know, I've explained already that quantum technologies have a bad impact, uh, on, uh, quantum, uh, on security on the one hand. And this is related to, uh, the, the, the problems caused by quantum computing. But on the other hand, uh, there's also, um, quantum physics can also help solve this problem. And this is what's known as quantum key distribution. I'll try to explain it with uh, a lot of intuition, but uh, it's a rather complicated system. So, uh, you know, let's think of a communication system. You can think of a communication system as uh, typically you have an emitter, let's call her Alice, and a receiver, we call him Bob, and they want to communicate. Typically, they will they will have there will be a physical medium transmitting the information. So you can think of it as a tennis game. Alice takes a tennis ball, writes a message she wants to send to Bob on the ball, and sends it across the network, and Bob catches the ball and reads the message. The problem is that someone could intercept uh, the data on the network, and that's why you need to protect uh, the communications. Now, what if Alice used soap bubbles? You see, you know, soap bubbles are fragile objects. So if she, instead of using a tennis ball, she uses a soap bubble. If someone tried to intercept the communications, there would be a modification in uh, the properties. The soap bubble would explode, would burst, and Alice and Bob could detect the interception. And that's the idea of quantum uh, key distribution, is to, to, to use fragile objects to communicate. And so normally, of course, no one uses tennis balls and soap bubbles. Traditionally, communication takes place on optical fiber networks, and in these networks, Bright pulses of light are sent down an optical fiber. And uh, these bright pulses of light, they consist of millions of photons. So someone can intercept a few photons and uh, but collect all the information being exchanged. This is the tennis ball. 
Now, what do we do in, in quantum heat distribution? Well, we use elementary light pulses. We send one photon at a time in the optical fiber. One photon is a quantum object. So if someone tries to intercept it, it gets detected because the, there's a modification. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And Alice and Bob can detect the uh, interception. Now, there's one point which is important, is that the this technology cannot prevent eavesdropping, but it can reveal it. But it only reveals it after it happens. And so it shouldn't be used to send valuable information because you would know that you've lost this information after losing it. It's actually much better to send a random sequence of bits from Alice to Bob to check whether it's been intercepted or not. And once you know that it has not been intercepted, you can use it to um, to encrypt information. And that's why a, bad, a good name for this technology is actually quantum key distribution. It's a distribution, it's a key distribution technology. Uh, as you can see here, you know, with, with present, there's a channel of, based on fragile objects on these single, single photons, which is used uh, for uh, the distribution of the key. But then the keys are used to encrypt the messages, the information, uh, actually, uh, by uh, using symmetric cryptography, which is strong and, and uh, with uh, long-term resistance. So, you know, typically, if you look currently in a data center, let's say you have two data centers, you want to connect these two data center, uh, primary data center backup, you typically do encryption. And right now you have uh, encryption using uh a combination of symmetric crypto and public key crypto. And the public key crypto could be intercepted here and broken if there's a quantum computer. Because first you generate a key uh, using RSA, uh, and then the key is used to encrypt the data. And so there's vulnerability here if someone can intercept this communication. What we do in quantum communication is actually to uh, add a parallel channel, so it's a second optical fiber where we do quantum key distribution. Uh, and then in both sides, we produce an encryption key, which is then used here and here, uh, here to encrypt, here to decrypt. And in that case, by combining quantum uh, key distribution with AES, with strong symmetric crypto, you get long-term security. So in practice, you know, that's a nice principle. Does it exist? Well, so you see here uh, the hardware of our third generation quantum key distribution system. So you see that it's a telecom chassis, 6U, still pretty big. We're working on making it smaller. But, and uh, so you connect an optical fiber on one side. And then on the other hand, you have a similar device uh, with a receiver. Uh, so the photons go from A to B. But then anyway, you produce the same key at both hands, so it's symmetric and it's used to, to, to encrypt. Um, and uh, one of the challenges is that the communication distance is limited. And so here, I'm going to try to explain why this is the case. So if you want to do long distance, uh, first of all, you're sending one photon at a time. So the photon will be, uh, when the fiber gets too long, it will be absorbed. So as a, if you increase the distance, as you can see horizontally, the probability of getting your photon through the fiber will decrease exponentially. You note know that it's a log scale here. So it will decrease exponentially. Now there's a noise floor. You know, your receiver has what, what we call dark counts. It sees photons even if there are no photons. This is dark count. You see that so the signal to noise ratio will decrease and eventually there is a point where it's not enough, and there will be a limitation in distance. And obviously, you cannot amplify the signal because if you amplify, you, you modify it, you perturb it. You know, otherwise, an adversary should would be able to amplify uh, the signal. And so, this technology, you see, an experiment done by our partners at the University of Geneva, they demonstrated uh, QKD over 300 kilometers, uh, and they even made a longer distance demonstration. I think the, the work record is around 400 kilometers of uh, quantum key distribution. In our case, we, we're limited to a bit of a shorter distance. This, the, the practical system that I showed you here works to about uh, between, optimally between 50 to 100 kilometers. And so uh, now what can you do with this technology? Well, you can build networks point to point, but you can also build relays 
So build a chain of relays, and these relays need to be trusted. Uh, but you can then extend the distance. Uh, pro- but of course, uh, it's it's quantum only um, point to point. Here, there is classical. The keys are exist, so uh, it should not be possible for an adversary to look uh, here. So that these net nodes should be trusted nodes. But you can then build a long distance chain, uh, which guarantees uh, distribution. And you can use the same things to build hub and spoke or star network, to build ring networks or to connect ring networks. So really something similar to classical telecommunication. You can, you can network quantum key distribution, but you need to trust uh, the nodes and make sure that an adversary cannot go into uh, these nodes. Now, of course, quantum key distribution is about key distribution. So you need to encrypt the data. And so we're working with, uh, you know, traditional vendors in order to do encryption of different layers. And so you see, for example, that we work with a company in Europe called Adva to do layer one encryption. For layer two encryption, uh, Thales uh, has a solution which is compatible with our quantum key distribution systems. We also offer one. For NPLS, there are other companies, Hitachi and ADB. For layer three, again, Thales, Fortinet, Cisco. So you see really, I think what's important here to understand is that Quantum key distribution is not a solution. It's an enabling technology for secure communication. It needs to be uh, interfaced with traditional encryption. But uh, now you really have a lot of solutions that are compatible with quantum key distribution and it's ready to be deployed. And here is one example. This is uh, uh, an example where you would want to do data center to data center encryption. So you have two links you know, uh, in, a, in a metropolitan area optical fiber links, you put encryptors, so you secure the communications between the, the, the two data centers here and here, but you also do quantum key distribution in parallel in order to provide the keys and to secure the communication. This was the first application of quantum key distribution and is relatively mainstream now. Uh, SK Telecom, our um, partner in Korea, has an approach of using quantum technologies in 5G. And so you see that uh, in their network, uh, they have a backbone, they have a core network, and then an access network. They use quantum key distribution all the way to the radio segment. Uh, so they secure really the core of the network, the, 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 the high-speed links of the network using quantum key distribution. And then on the edge on the radio, they do standard uh, security, so traditional cryptography, but use also QRG for high security, stronger keys. So that's uh, an application. And uh, you see here in 2019, we deployed with SK Telecom uh, in South Korea, backbone uh, for 5G, where I think uh, now 90% of the, of the traffic that is uh, used for 5G in, in uh, South Korea is actually secured using quantum key distribution. You see that we, we had to build, uh, between the two points, we had to build two trusted repeaters uh, along the way because of the distance. Uh, and uh, so, so there were actually uh, four segments in this network and it's up and running uh, completely well. Um, another example of this is British Telecom, which is working uh, with us to secure a link in the UK between their research center in Adastral Park in, uh, in the east of the UK and Cambridge, uh, where there's a local network for test. Uh, so this is to say that also in Europe, uh, there, there are some uh, deployments of quantum key distribution. And I'll actually tell you about large scale deployments. I've mentioned earlier that um, you, you can build networks uh, based on, on quantum uh, key distribution. And I think there are two regions where uh, this is the most advanced. First of all, there's China. So China has been building quantum networks. They started initially uh, in 2016, I believe, with a link, a 2,000 kilometer link between Beijing and Shanghai. So it was one of these chain of trusted nodes. Uh, there were 30 nodes uh, in between. And after that, there was a second phase, which is uh, actually probably ending now, which is to, to extend and build um, a total distance of 11,000 kilometers of uh, quantum key distribution secured optical fiber links with function uh, 
to, to integrate various uh, economic area and to offer secure communications for uh, various uh, sectors. They mentioned financial sector, government, uh, and others in China. So China is very advanced with the deployment of quantum communications. Europe is preparing to do a large scale project. So there is currently now a test bed. Uh, which started last year and is going to last until 2022. It's a three-year project. The idea is to test use cases. You know, we mentioned 5G, other other use cases, finance, healthcare, etc. Uh, and so in various areas in, in Europe. And also there are some feasibility studies to deploy a network which will uh, cover the whole of Europe. So this is really going to be a large-scale network. Uh, and uh, which will cover the whole of Europe. And what's interesting is that it will, will, it will also involve some uh, satellite links, which I will discuss last, last. But before we move to satellite, I'll just mention that the market requirements for this are to make QKD smaller, cheaper. It's still a bit too expensive, but you know, as a uh, supplier, we're working on making it cheaper and also to cover longer distances. So um, now, you know, you can traditionally quantum key distribution works on an optical fiber where you have uh, an emitter and a receiver and optical fiber link in between. Now you could remove the optical fiber and put two telescopes and you could send the photon through the air. And if the weather is good, uh, it works very well because the air is transparent, obviously. And you could even put one of the stations on a satellite uh, and, and, uh, and then send photons down from a satellite to uh, a, a node on, on the ground. Then the satellite would move and could send uh, another key to uh, another node. And then by, by making some operations, the satellite could uh, enable to build longer distances. And, and so, so these um, space communications, uh, quantum communication in space has been demonstrated in 2016, China launched a satellite and they were able to demonstrate that this works between China and, and Europe. Uh, and now there's work in, in various areas, in, in Japan, in Canada, in also uh, in Europe, to actually build satellites in order to, to offer a long distance service based on quantum communication. And I think that eventually in the long term, uh, it will be a mix of uh, uh, ground network based on optical fibers for regional access and then long distance based on space communications. So I reached out the end of my presentation. Uh, a few takeaways uh, which are important. First of all, you know, do not delay. It's important for long-term security data that must be protected. People need to start thinking about uh, uh, the impact of quantum computing on, on uh, cryptography. Number two, know your data. What are the vulnerabilities? What needs to be protected for how long? Because if something needs to be protected for a very long time, you need to start now thinking about what will happen when there's a quantum computer. Make sure that you use strong keys. If you want very strong keys, use a quantum random number generator. Pursue crypto agility. Make sure that you can upgrade cryptography so that you can follow progress and attacks and vulnerability to attacks. And finally, there will be different solutions. One size does not fit all. And so quantum key distribution is an application, uh, is, can already be used to secure high uh, security links uh, for critical uh, networks, critical infrastructure that require long-term security, for example, in healthcare, the government, or uh, finance. Now, I think it's a very exciting time for quantum technologies. We're not talking not only about quantum science anymore. We're now also talking about quantum engineering. It's not about research, proof of concept, uh, theoretical research. It's also now about engineering. And it's a very exciting time. And I think, you know, uh, that it's important to also create programs for quantum engineering so that young people can learn about quantum physics and be trained in quantum physics and engineering because we're gonna need a lot of skilled people that mix both physics and engineering uh, skills. But anyway, there will be a lot of very interesting opportunities ahead of us. So with that, I will 
thank you for your attention. And um, it was really a pleasure uh, to present uh, what uh, is the status of quantum communication and quantum safe security in 2020. Thank you very much for your attention.